I'd like to welcome you to uh, QSU's second event of Pride Week, also sponsored by the LGBTQ Center. Um, speaker Julie Sondra Decker. Um, so Julie is a writer, blogger, and activist for the asexual and aromantic community. She's written extensively for Good Vibrations blog and has also made substantial contributions to the ace community through her blogging. She's happily asexual and aromantic and works hard to bridge the gap between ace and queer communities because she loves them both and believes they would benefit mutually from solidarity. Her nonfiction title, The Invisible Orientation, will be released this September. So now let's welcome Julie. Here and there, um, and you may not, you may not know. 
you may not have any idea that the person that you're, that you're, that you're interested in or is dating is going to turn out to be an asexual person. Um, but also, um, the, uh, even people who are, not, who, who, are not, who are not personally involved in one of these relationships, um, they need to know how to be good allies to people, and they need to know what these relationships are like, especially if they are in some kind of counselor or mental health profession. I think a lot of the people who, are, who get involved in uh, queer communities, various support communities, do end up in some kind of supportive role in some way. So it's really important that this is something that they at least get some kind of understanding about, or else they could accidentally say something that would shut out uh, certain aspects of these relationships. So, um, also, uh, not, it's not just asexual people and non-asexual people who have different desires in relationships. I think just about everybody who's been in a relationship where they're the one that wants to have more sex or less sex than their partner or partners. So this, I think a lot of the things that I say, even though I'm gearing them more toward an asexual and non-asexual partnership perspective, um, can be generalized to other situations where you have a mismatch of desire, I think. So, um, let's go to the next one. Um, common misconceptions that I hear all the time when I, you know, I start talking about asexual relationships, people say, well, what do you need a relationship for? How could asexual people need that? Asexual people don't love like other people do. And of course, I think most of the people in this room probably know that that's not always true. Um, first of all, um, when asexual people have relationships, they want to know, well, how does, how does that work? What do, they, what do they consist of? What do asexual people want in a relationship? Most people will think that at least if a relationship isn't just based around sex, it at least involves sex, and that's part of what makes it romantic. Um, for a lot of people, that is something that you want to be part of your relationship, but it's not always the case. So, um, let's see, are we on the aromantic slide here? I, I happen to be an aromantic person, uh, which means I don't experience any kind of romantic attraction to other people. And sometimes people who are aromantic, like me, still want some kind of partner, just not in a romantic sense. So there are alternate kinds of relationships that don't involve romantic attraction that sometimes aromantic people have. But some of them, like me, I don't, I don't have a primary partner, and I'm happy that way. But most of the relationships that we're going to be talking about today are the romantic ones, uh, primarily between asexual people and non-asexual people. Now what I should say before I go on is that I will be talking about some hypothetical situations where um, I might talk about coercive situations, um, pressured situations, and um, I will be discussing consent just a little bit. Uh, nothing graphic or anything, just so you know, just a trigger warning there. Um, and that is because, um, as my next slide says, asexual and abstinent, abstinent are not synonyms. Um, there are actually people who are asexual, who have had sex, who do have sex, and may even like sex. That may sound like kind of a contradiction. I think some, some people have a hard time getting their mind around that, but it is true that you can like sex itself and not necessarily feel attracted to the person you're having it with. Um, so asexual people are not exempt from that. Um, so in a situation where you have an asexual person and a non-asexual person, um, relationships with asexual people are not necessarily going to be all or nothing. So it's not necessarily my way or the highway. Um, it's going to involve compromise, like any any relationship, on many different kinds of uh, issues. And sex is just one of those. So the the really important thing with understanding asexual relationships is that we are talking about different desires. We're not talking about one person wants sex too much. We're not talking about one person doesn't want sex enough. So. As long as you can frame the, the discourse when we talk about trying to come to an agreement about how to, how to work out these relationships, then um, framing it as different desires, nobody's the problem child, then you can, you can really actually get, uh, you, can, you can come to agreements that might surprise a lot of people. So, um, are we 
maybe on a common question here. Uh, okay, this is something that I hear a lot about because when when I talk about asexual people and non-asexual people trying to finesse their relationship around uh, one person wanting more sex than the other person wants to give, uh, you hear a lot of why don't asexual people just date each other, um, and that uh, I, I have a, I have a lot of reasons to give you guys for for that why why it's really uncommon. So um, what you see first is. Um, a lot of people who are asexual don't know they're asexual when they get into a relationship or they, or they didn't know uh, for a long time before they came out. So uh, that, can, that can cause a lot of issues when you're already in some kind of relationship with someone. And then you find this out about yourself and you say, well, um, I, uh, t you know, I, didn't, I didn't know I was going to be dealing with this. So um, the next the next thing that you run into is that uh, if you're not calling yourself anything, if you don't have a word for your experience, you're not going to know what, what to call yourself, you're not going to know, and other people who might identify that way, they don't know what to call themselves either. So it's really hard to find each other when you're in that kind of situation. So, um, what else do I have here? Um, oh yes, uh, they, they may already be in a relationship that they, they don't want to lose what they already have over, uh, over a difference in their desires. So my second reason, which would be the small and scattered dating pool. Um, there's some disagreement as to how common is asexuality. The, the, the percentage here tossed around a lot is 1%. That comes from an, uh, something that uh, Anthony Bogart was involved in this uh, sexuality survey came up with that figure, and actually, even though it's been criticized, he said in a recent uh, radio interview that he believes that's actually that's actually still pretty close to what is accurate. Um, I'm sure those of you in this room who are uh, identify as something other than straight know that it can it can just multiply the issues if your dating pool is much smaller. Um, so ASAP people have that too with one percent of the population. Um, so they are often the only one in their whole social group. If, if you have 100 people and one of them is asexual, I mean, how, on, how many of us hang out with 100 friends? You know, so it can often be very difficult to find someone, just to find someone who chance. Who's your same orientation if you're asexual? Um, and then, <laughs> similarly, there's no, there's no asexual night at the club. Um, there's, uh, I wonder what that would look like, actually. <laughs> Ace bar. Meetups are sometimes starting to happen, but um, I think that that's, that's just getting started. I think that we'll, we'll see more of that as time goes on, but most of us are part of larger organizations like, you know, like, like um, LGBT outreach, and uh, again, we don't find that we're the only one. So um, what else? Uh, we have a third bullet here. Uh, have you ever heard this? Oh, my whole life, my, my cousin's gay. Uh, I should introduce you. You get along. So, what are the chances, right? I mean, it's so unlikely that just because somebody has the same orientation as you that they will make a, a perfect mate. Um, and then, so all of that leads to long distance relationships are usually the most likely. Um, some of us get lucky and find somebody else who happens to live in the same area or is willing to move into the same area. But uh, long distance relationships are a lot more likely and those have their own challenges. And uh, obviously I don't have the time or the scope to go into why long distance relationships have their own issues, but that that is one of the things that contributes to asexual and asexual dating being really uncommon. Um, my third one is um, other factors often matter. Sometimes if you have things to agree on, uh, you may not be so fixated on whether you have to compromise on sex. So um, there's uh, living arrangements like um, if you're going to have kids, uh, where are you going to live? Those things are just as likely to, to be really important to people. So uh, sometimes if that's, if that's something that you found compatibility on, um, you might be okay with sec your sexual orientation not being a perfect match if you have that, and that's more important to you. Um, and then uh, 
here's another one. Um, this is sometimes sort of a dicey issue, but uh, sometimes asexual people describe sex as it's just something I'm not all that interested in. It's just something to do. It's, it seems to be really important to a lot of people, but some asexual people that I've heard in the community say it's kind of like watching a TV show that I don't like just to support it. And I, I think that some people are insulted by that. They're like, really? That's how they view it? Something they just humor me about? And I, I can understand why people don't, don't like that when somebody says it, but it is a perspective I've seen. And then uh, finally, uh, my fourth point is uh, Asexual people, well, people in general, are taught that relationships are not actually romantic relationships unless you're doing it. So um, here's a, they, uh, you know, they may, they may be dealing with these uh, these common misperceptions that uh, your relationship isn't really actually romantic. They may, they may do it to themselves and say, well, if I don't want to have sex with this person, I guess it's really not a relationship, and uh, they may be affected by the, the internalized shame that comes with that. So my conclusion is, on, on the asexual relationships is that uh, you know most asexual people who have romantic relationships end up saying, I'm, uh, I'm going to end up having a relationship with a non-asexual person. And a lot of people are totally fine with that. Um, so what we have to do when we're in these situations is the compromise, the C word. Um, and again, it's really important to view it as not, this is not how we fix one of the partners involved. So uh, here's an overview of the ways that mixed orientation relationships have succeeded. And this is stuff that I've actually heard from successful couples or groups uh, that involve at least one asexual person. And this is, this is going to be just kind of a broad brush, but I'll go into some of these points more later. So this is my successful mixed orientation relationships list. Um, when I have a, a partner with sexual needs gives up sex, and that is one extreme end. The, uh, the other extreme end is this one, which is the partners agree to regular or occasional sex. So somebody gets their way. Um, this is the third one is slightly less common, uh, open relationship. Uh, in most cases, if somebody agrees to an open relationship, it's uh, the person who feels that they want to have sexual satisfaction in their marriage or their partnership, that they will be allowed to go outside of the relationship to do it. Um, that's not always how it works, but that is one common open relationship that works. Um, and then uh, similarly, number four would be the partners are polyamorous, and uh, some people don't know what that distinction is, but it, that's different from an open relationship in that the person who, you know, there might be a couple and then there's a, a third or a fourth person that's brought in that they're all together rather than one person is dating or having sex outside. Um, and then the fifth one is the most common and probably the most successful is that the partners will agree to physically or emotionally intimate experiences that don't violate anybody's boundaries and do satisfy the intimate desires that all of the partners may or may not have. So um, these are these are usually these are usually involve compromises. So I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, but one thing I should say before I go on is sometimes you can't make it work. And that's not always a terrible thing. Sometimes you do have to look at your differences and say, this is just not gonna work for me. Um, asexual people they're, they, a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm a terrible person because I can't make myself, I can't make myself do it and to make my partner happy, but you're not a terrible person if you, if you can't, if you can't deal with that. And also, you know, not a terrible people or not, you're not, you're not, you're not the devil <laughs> if you, if you say, no, I just can't be with a person who doesn't desire me. That's, that's what I, that's my ideal relationship with somebody who desires me. I desire them, and I, I can't deal with this. That's, it's painful, but you know, sometimes the best thing to do in an incompatible relationship is to say, you know, our differences are just, they're too great, and we'll both be happier if we go our separate ways. Um, so, um, now I'm gonna go on to the question I get all the time. <laughs> Help, my long-term partner has 
come out as asexual and now wants to change things. So that that's the that's the one that I get the most when I hear about relationships, um, and it's usually from the person who has had an asexual partner come out to them rather than from the asexual person. Um, so this is this is one thing when they say, "Oh, everything was fine before what happened." We, I mean, they didn't say anything. In all these years, we we're happy, uh, but everything was fine. Well, chances are, you know, it wasn't. Um, the the, the truth of the matter is that consent under pressure, even if it's not from the partner, isn't really consent. And um, there are a lot of reasons why a partner who has been having sex that they didn't want might not tell you. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the one about uh, even if a partner doesn't pressure directly, they'll still maybe possibly feel dysfunction. They may feel that um, you know they're uh, the world says that this relationship is not, there's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with me, I'm not going to talk to my partner about it. Um, and uh, also, they may have been ashamed to say, like, look, I love this person so much, but I'm not attracted to them. So they may have had a really hard time saying that to somebody that they love and care about, knowing it might hurt them. So um, when you say everything was fine before, that means that you're you're refusing. You may be trying to refuse to work with their needs and say my my needs are the ones that are the most important in this relationship. So if they're if they're if they're bringing this up to you, it's probably something that you need to come to but come to an agreement in the middle on. So uh, and here's another one that I hear a lot. So like, am I really bad at sex? I mean, my partner came out as asexual, and I must be just like not sexy or bad at sex, or were they lying to me about how they felt? So, the answer to that is, um, <laughs> this is something you hear a lot. It's not you, it's me, but in this case it's true. Um, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something that you could do differently. If your partner just isn't sexually attracted to you and still wants to be with you, there's nothing you can do different. It's their sexual orientation. So, um, and the reason that this sometimes happens is you're, the, the partners often confuse their sexual and romantic attraction. Society often says they're kind of the same thing. Um, and in the asexual community, we of course, we, we, we talk about our romantic attraction separately from our sexual attraction most of the time because they are separate from most of us. So um, they may have said, well, I, I love this person. I'm attracted to them in some way. That must be sexual attraction. I just don't quite know what's wrong. They may not have words to express that. Um, and then, uh, so the non-asexual person in this situation, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't fail, they didn't mess it up, uh, and they, they didn't turn the person asexual. <laughs> so, um, and furthermore, um, sex is often still special, even if the, even if the, the person who's, who's asexual may not have uh, thought of, oh, I want to that's, sex is how I want to express my, my love and my care for this person. It may have still been special, and maybe it, it's probably something they don't do with a whole lot outside of the relationship, unless you have an open relationship that you already knew about. Um, okay, so the next one would be, uh, why, why not keep having sex if they, if they had sex with me before? What's the big deal about continuing? And what's different now? So it is a big deal. They're bringing it up. If they want to change something, then it is something that you do need to deal with. Um, sex shouldn't be any kind of obligation. So, um, if you're in this situation where you feel like, well, it's not a big deal. You should just we should keep things the way they were. What was wrong with it before? Um, what would happen if we turned that around like this? Like, just go without sex. No big deal. Um, that would be a really big deal to a lot of people. So, um, for asexual people, sometimes it's it's a very big deal to have sex. Uh, and I think this is my my last point in this section is uh, can we see a counselor? And um, that's not a bad idea. Um, it's not totally out, but one thing that you should remember if you do decide to bring in a, a mental health professional, a relationship counselor of some kind, uh, some professionals don't. Acknowledge asexuality yet, 
even though there are a couple of exceptions now written in the DSM-5, which is uh, that's, that's kind of a victory for us. Um, so, uh, and then also, uh, this, I would say this doesn't happen very often, but um, sometimes an asexual partner wants to learn to be more sexually active. They're like, I want to, this is not something that comes naturally to me, but I want to, I want to be intimate in a way that will make my partner happy. And sometimes a sex counselor or a marriage counselor, somebody in that neighborhood can help with that, but it should absolutely be something that everybody's on board with. It shouldn't be somebody's idea that we're going to we're gonna convince this person. And that can be, that can be kind of a hairy issue, so, but I just wanted to throw it in there. So uh, before I go on, does anybody want to ask or say anything on the subject? I saw a couple of things go into the box, I think. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at those. I think we'll look at those at the end. Should we look at them at the end? Yeah, OK. So um, I'm just going to go on to this next part, which uh, this is uh, your relationship with an asexual partner, right? Suggestions. OK, great. I can't see the screen. <laughs> so. Um, this is where I'm going to get into more specific aspects of if you are a person who is not asexual and you want to have an asexual partner, you, know, you, you do currently or you want to date someone and that person turns out to be asexual, here are some things you might want to keep in mind. Um, so number one would be uh, discuss your deal breakers and your must-haves. I think this is the key one. Really, this is the key one. Um, and by, of course, by deal breakers, it means like I will I'm, it's a, I'm out of this relationship if I have to do this, or I'm out of this relationship if I have to go without that. Um, and then, of course, must have. So it's the opposite of that. Um, relatedly, number two would be using a checklist. I don't know if uh, any of y'all have ever seen this, uh, but uh, the next uh, slide is you probably can't read this, but it's just an example of a, there's a yes, no, maybe checklist at a site called Scarletine. Um, another one would be the Want, will, won't checklist. It's smart, hot, fun. Uh, sometimes they're really explicit, in depth. But uh, using these as a guide, like this is what I will do. This is what I kind of want to do. This is what I won't do. You can get, a, you can get an idea of doing it with your partner, uh, partners, and decide what what you'll accept, what you really desire in your relationship, and see where you can meet in the middle. Um, another one would be con communicating about your signals for intimacy. This is sometimes, uh, this is more difficult for people who are um, outside of the realms of uh, traditional, I think. Uh, and that is a lot of asexual people. Some asexual people's signals for intimacy are different than uh, they might expect. They might be more subtle or they might be more explicit. Uh, and then the non-asexual person might want to say, uh, when I say this, when I do this, um, or when, I, uh, when we do this activity together, it makes me want to uh, engage in this kind of intimacy. You want to communicate what your personal sign your personal signals are. Um, so uh, also focusing on what makes your relationship different from people you're not in a relationship with. Sometimes I can really help make it you know, make it more special. And say like I never do this with my with, with my friends. This is something that's reserved for us only, and really just try to bring that more into the forefront so that you can focus on the specialness of your relationship. Um, another one is acknowledging sexual needs. Don't always outrank all the other needs. Um, there are a lot of emotional needs that everybody in a partnership will have, and uh, focusing on those can, uh, it, it can kind of downplay some of the places where you don't match. Next, how about discussing the, the sensual? A lot of asexual people talk about, I like cuddling, but it can't go past such and such place, or else I get uncomfortable, but I really like kissing, or I really like massage, or something like that. They may be very sensual people, and that can be a source of a lot of, uh, a lot of intimacy between people who, who may not be having traditional sex. Um, how about uh, the next one would be sharing how, how does sex connect to romance for you? Some people say, it's our anniversary, and when it's our anniversary, that's what I'd like to do to celebrate it. Sometimes they say, I wanna, I'll, 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 
motor men with you because I really appreciated something that you did. Sometimes you see a lot of people like the saying, I can't believe that it was my birthday and they didn't they didn't want to have sex with me for my birthday. I feel really offended, you know, just but it's that's a real example from my life. Um, and the person was confused, like I didn't know that, that person wanted sex on their birthday. So sometimes sometimes that is uh, needs to be explicit. Um, next, uh, this is another thing that comes from my real life uh, respecting if they think something is sexual, even if you, know, you might not think that. The examples that I have seen would be walking around naked after the shower. Um, I know somebody who was bothered by that. They said, you know, it really bothers me when she gets out of the shower and walks around like that. Um, and the other one was, uh, I, I knew a guy who would always smack his girlfriend on the butt, and she was uh, she felt that that was too intimate to do in public, and he said that's not intimate, that's not sexual at all. What you know, what you need to do is listen to that. That person feels that that was more intimate than you meant it to be, so you gotta you gotta communicate about that. Um, and similarly, uh, being willing to be specific about um, your your. Uh, your desires rather than relying on innuendo. Um, it's kind of a stereotype in the asexual community that some of us are oblivious to uh, sex jokes and sexual references. Some of us are, some of us aren't. But I think it's safe to say that a lot of us are not thinking about it as much as the rest of the world. So we, we may not catch it that that person was flirting with us or that person was making, making a, an offer. So sometimes, if, if you happen to be dating someone who's in that situation, you may have to be more explicit. Um, next, I have, um, if sometimes asexual people like to be the one to instigate. And sometimes, I know someone who says, I always wear a certain outfit to bed if I would accept uh, my, my husband uh, wanting to have sex that night, and he knows that. So wearing a certain thing, saying a certain thing, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, I think comfort that some asexual people take in being the initiator, so that they don't feel surprised or overwhelmed by it. And uh, this next one ties in asking if they'd like to schedule sex or have forewarning. I know someone who does this by texting in the morning and says, you know, do you want to be intimate tonight? Would you like to, you know? And then they they have a day to process it. Because this particular person that I knew said whenever it, whenever their husband would come on to them, it would seem so sudden, it would seem so out of the blue, where the husband had been thinking about it all day. So um, this person said, I say yes so much more often if I know it's coming. And that's, that's one possibility. Um, next I have, uh, make sure that you don't get sulky or give someone the silent treatment or something if, if they said no because that will actually lead to more no. Um, nobody likes to disappoint each other, but uh, that, that's, that, that is a really common thing. Um, next I have, um, this situation is when uh, some asexual people enjoy sex. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, and uh, just because they may have vocally enjoyed it or uh, you know, said it was really good doesn't mean that if you had some kind of agreement, like, hey, we'll have sex twice a week, that they must be indicating they want it more. Um, sometimes you need to uh, look, at your, look at your agreement with that person and say, okay, this is, uh, this is something that we need, to, we need to stay with unless we have discussed changing it. Here is, here's another one, this has a few bullet points here, I think, understanding nuances. Um, so a lot of people have trouble understanding that an asexual person might not like sex, might like sex but not feel sexual attraction. Um, they, may, they may really like getting someone else off but not experiencing it themselves. Um, and here's, there's actually a pretty, pretty big subsection of the asexual Likes who's kinky, who likes BDSM. Um, I wonder how often that's been said in this room. <laughs> <laughs> a 
love saying it, BDSM. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun, I don't know. Um, but there's, there's actually, a, um, as an aside, there's a, on Fet Life, I think, there's specifically asexual groups because there are a lot of asexual people, they don't want, they may not want sex as part of their BDSM experience, but they like BDSM experience. So understanding the nuances of those with your particular partner can really help you connect. Next, I have uh, cleaning the partner's possible outness. I'm sure most of the people in this room understand that some people are out, some people are totally not, and that it's really important that you don't out people. But uh, if your asexual partner is out and proud and on the internet all the time talking about non-sex, um, then it's, it's really helpful and really supportive and usually really appreciated if work as, a, as an ally within that relationship. Uh, and relatedly, is this 16 year, okay? Um, educating others on asexuality. Um, I know someone who, when uh, you know, he has a boyfriend, and then when he wasn't there, his boyfriend got a whole bunch of questions about asexuality because they didn't feel comfortable asking him, but they asked the boyfriend. And he felt, the boyfriend actually felt really uncomfortable with that. He answered a little bit, and then he, he just said, you know what, you'll have to, you'll have to ask my boyfriend because, um, you know, I don't, I'm not asexual, I don't know. Um, so, unfortunately, that uh, sometimes it involves them asking really personal and sometimes shaming questions. So, a part of being a good, supportive uh, ally for your partner, if you're, if you're a non-asexual person dating an asexual person, is educating others on this. If you don't feel comfortable in that role, then, you know, I think some, somebody write, wrote a book, I heard that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have, you know, there are YouTube videos, and um, there are articles, there are blogs out the wazoo, there's lots and lots of resources. If you don't feel comfortable educating specifically on this, but you want to be supportive. Um, and then, uh, next I have reassurance. Or if you're dating someone and you're not going to leave them, then telling them, you know, no, we're not going to break up over this, it's okay. Uh, that, that really does wonders. However, um, lastly, uh, if you do decide to break up, uh, it can sometimes be, you know, in the heat of the moment, things will come out, but try to avoid saying somebody like you will never, will never be able to, to deserve a partner or something like that. because. Asexual people already think that a lot of the time. <laughs> and um, so if you do decide to break up over your differences, make sure you express that it's it's you know, your own preferences. It's not because asexual people can't date non-asexual people. Some can. So, um, and then, uh, <laughs> I want to say a few words for asexual people and those who want to support them. Um, kind of from an asexual perspective, uh, some suggestions. So if you are an asexual person and you want to date another asexual person, there are actually some social networking possibilities. Um, so there's some pictures there of a bunch of dating sites and matching sites. Believe it or not, Facebook. Did you know about this? Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a list of them if anybody wants to grab one after. Uh, some of them are are not necessarily asexual sites. They're maybe where somebody doesn't want to have sex in a relationship for any reason, but they're usually asexual friendly. So, um, and the AVEN forums, asexuality.org, does have meetup forums. It's really cool. So next, uh, when you're, if you're an asexual person and you're dating a non-asexual person, negative reactions are really common, and it's not. It's not personal, try not to internalize it. Um, also, next one is uh, if, you, if you're feeling guilted or coerced or you know, pressured, it's really, it's really common to feel that. And uh, if somebody is using that against you, it's, that, is, that is abusive, so you don't, you don't have to put up with it. The reason that I mention this is that I've met so many asexual people who said that their partner told them I have a right to expect this in my marriage, so um, you, you have to, <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, I think you do have a right to expect that that's probably going to be part of your relationship, 
but if it isn't, then you need to you need to go on from that, accepting that as your new normal, I guess, um, or go your separate ways. So, um, and also for asexual people, uh, your desires and your needs are just are, are equally important. Um, sometimes the people in your life will tell you that you need to be, if you're the asexual person, you need to be the one to back down and compromise. Um, but somebody else's needs should always outrank yours. And um, I think my, my last one here for asexual people is when you're negotiating your intimacy, uh, there are a whole bunch of categories that you can examine your interest in, your tolerance for. Here's my bulleted list. Um, and there are asexual people who like and don't like all of these. Um, you know, obviously kissing, petting, foreplay, sex as in what kinds. Sometimes there are certain kinds of sex that some asexual people will have and not others. Um, and again, I, I mentioned earlier BDSM. I said it again in a church. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, touching of various sorts, um, sleeping in the same bed, that can be really intimate. Um, again, open relationships, polyamory, uh, watching a partner, and also watching porn. Sometimes you watch it together, sometimes you say, it's okay with me if you watch it, but I don't want to watch it. And then using toys. I actually know several asexual and non-asexual partners that they use toys on each other, and they like that, and that's that's what they they do for intimacy, um, and for, for whatever reason, that's what that's that's totally fine with uh, both the people in the partnership. Um, and before I move on to this last section, which is non-romantic relationships, does anybody want to say anything or ask anything this time? Okay, <laughs> I'll read the questions at the end that were in the box, but this is my last very short section: um, non-romantic relationships. This is my favorite in friendships. Um, you know, we know what friendships are, but um, this bullet here, just friends. Um, as a person who doesn't have a primary relationship in a romantic sense or like a domestic partnership sense, my friendships are my relationships. They are they're the most important relationships that I have. And I'm, I'm really happy with those, but I really hate it when people say just friends because there's nothing just about it, you know. Um, and also, uh, aromantic and romantic people often want their friendships. And sometimes your friendships can, you know, even if you do like romantic relationships, your friendships may sometimes outrank some of those romantic relationships. Um, though I don't want to put a rank on, on things, you know what I mean. Um, and then my second category is um, your platonic partners, also sometimes called second family domestic partners or companions. Um, basically, there are types of relationships that function very much like romantic partners that don't have romantic attraction in them. So um, they may be partnered like romantic partners and they may live together, may often be mistaken for dating each other, but they, in this relationship, are saying they don't feel romantic attraction to each other, and sometimes it's more than two. Um, uh, they may actually own property together, and uh, I actually know uh, an asexual couple that is not that is not sexually, not romantically attracted to each other, but they're raising children together, um, and they may be intimate in other ways. And then finally, um, based on this on the sex or the gender or the perceived gender of the person's partner, they're often judged as being uh, you know, being uh, the sexual orientation that you would assume based on that. Um, so a lot of times they can they can they can be misinterpreted from outside as like that's a gay couple or that's a straight couple, but inside the relationship they don't they don't necessarily uh, they don't they don't act like that inside of the relationship. So. Um, and then this is my, my question slide. I've come to the end of the presentation. So um, does anybody want to want to talk? Anybody want to say anything? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so even for people who aren't in these relationships, what are the best ways to, I guess, support someone in one of these relationships, especially one that's non-asexual, asexual? Um, like if you have like, 
friends or just acquaintances that are in these relationships that may be like struggling to get over like something related to asexuality? So you're saying um, as a person who is not part of a relationship, but you have a, a friend or a close person in your life who is struggling in, yeah. in a situation like that, and they're an asexual person? Yes, or like say it's a couple that has an asexual and a non-asexual yes. um, partner together, right? Okay. So like what, like how can you be a support network for them as a friend? Like how involved are friends usually in those relationships? Um, that's a good question. Um, as you might imagine, it's pretty individual, I think. Right. Um, but I, you can you can never you can never I think you can never care too much. It's just a question of how you express your care. Some sometimes people can be they can feel really secure if they have a group, and you might say, "Hey, you know, do you want to come meet with our group?" Like it might be it might be specifically like a queer support kind of group, or it might just be friends. Um, but other than that, I would also say, what do you, do you want to talk about it? Like, ask them to take kind of take the lead in showing you what kind of support. Because I think the, the best advice I can give to anybody who wants to be any kind of ally is to learn, learn to be a good listener. And I think, I think that works for any kind of ally. So um, I would say make yourself available to listen. Um, no, that's, no. Yeah, just that's, a good question. Out, that's a good question because I actually see that a lot on the uh, on the asexuality forums that people say, "I know somebody that's going through this. Um, how can I help?" And most people just say what I said and also maybe do some learning about what they're going through so that you don't accidentally say something something odd. Like I, you know, I have a, I have a, an asexual friend who went through a breakup. And everybody kept saying, there's other fish in the sea. And it just really upset her a lot. Because <laughs> other fish in the sea just really didn't, didn't work for her. Um, does anybody want to say anything before I look at these? Anybody else? OK, I'm wetting the whistle here. OK. Um, I'm going to guess a, is it okay if uh, if you put a thing in the in the box? I'm just going to read out what you wrote, so everybody knows what I'm seeing here, and then I'll address it. Um, so uh, I have, as someone who identifies as ace and romantic, I'm actually pretty terrified of ending up alone as friends and others settle down or move. Could you speak a bit to your experience with platonic relationships? Um, First, I have to say I feel like I've been really lucky in my life. Um, as a person who's in that same, same situation, I'm, I'm 36 years old. And most of my friends are married or partnered. And uh, the ones that have mattered to me the most are the ones that I have continued to have communication with and who didn't dump me for their significant other. And it, it, they are out there. Like, sometimes it seems like they aren't, but I really believe, just from my own experience, I have I, I have been very fortunate to forge really in-depth and long-lasting relationships with my platonic friends. Um, my best friend since high school is married with two children. Her first child is named after me. And we celebrated 20 years of friendship with a road trip two months ago. <laughs> so. It was wonderful. We ate cupcakes every day. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and um, I have, I actually have a, two male friends that I've had for a really long time. One of them I met on the internet in 1996. He's quite a heterosexual man, but he's, he has always accepted me for who I am, never, never shamed me or pressured me or anything, and he's always been there for me. And he actually was my temporary roommate for a while, beginning of last year before he found the job and moved out. That was great. Um, and uh, my friend Joe is a, uh, he's frequently misinterpreted as my boyfriend. <laughs> and um, because, you know, there's a straight guy and there's a girl who's, I guess, reasonably, passively hot or something. And what else could he be doing at her house? 
we answered, but they didn't listen. Um, and you know what he told me one day, which it almost made me cry, honestly. Um, he said, if I ever had a girlfriend and she had a problem with you, I would dump her first. And uh, that's just so wonderful, you know. Just to, I, so I feel like I've been lucky. I don't know. I don't know how to tell other people. For me, my relationships have survived on communication and honesty, and um, there's some really good people out there. So um, I think I think that's the best I can do in offering answering your question. But I will also say that that is a very real fear because we see the world the way it is. We see what people the emphasis that they place on their romantic relationships and how they disappear sometimes just think that their their friends and the people that they used to pay attention to are not important anymore. Um, and that's not just asexual or aromantic people, but as an aromantic person, I'm always, I'm, I'm never the one who does it to someone else, so I guess it, it seems worse when it happens, but uh, not everyone will do that to you. And uh, I, I had three really good examples. Anybody want to say anything before I go to the next one? You guys are quiet. <laughs> okay, um, what's the best way to approach a potential significant other who isn't asexual to tell them that you might be asexual? That is hard um, because it's so individual. But uh, there, I actually have a video on this called I think I called it Letters to an Asexual Number 16. Um, and somebody asked me that same question, like, how do I, how do I come out? Um, and there are, there are a few ways I go over in that, in that video, but uh, some of them involve getting the other person to ask a question or start a conversation. Uh, that can be done either with something goofy like wearing a shirt that has a message on it that someone will ask you about and it has something do with asexuality or a button on your on your bag, or you can post something on a social networking site that's a, a, an article and say, what does everyone think of this? And that can start a conversation. Sometimes you can send, uh, you can send um, an article or a video or a documentary. I was actually, I was in, a, I think I mentioned earlier, in a documentary, Asexual, it's available on, on uh, Netflix, and you can watch that with some and uh, sometimes it's really hard to, to, to say it out loud, so some people have had luck writing a letter. Uh, but sometimes it's also better to just bring it up in, in a conversation more naturally. You don't have a feeling you have to sit them down and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to come back to you now. I mean, sometimes that works, but uh, honestly, I think the most successful ones I've seen are the ones that developed out of a natural conversation where he said, you know, uh, you know, I never, I, I never had that with anybody or you know, something like that. With a significant other, it can be a little, a little hairier, I think. Um, but I do recommend that it is brought up fairly early in the dating process um, and that you try to avoid feeling like you're confessing something terrible. Um, it's just something about you. So, um, I don't know if I really answered that question well enough, so if whoever asked that wants to talk about it in emails or something like that, I have my contact information available if you need it. Um, I have a couple more questions here, and then I think we might be done. Um, okay. Are there any legal protections that asexual people would benefit from? What? There is actually some overlap with uh, some of the LGBT rights that we have. Um, there are, I think it's two states that mention asexuality in their anti-discrimination laws, which is really neat. And believe it or not, Texas is considering it. Oh, Texas. Um, very odd. <laughs> but uh, they, they put in asexuality as one of the one of the protected classes of sexual orientation against discrimination or hate crimes is uh, would be helpful. And of 
course, marriage, marriage-related rights between asexual people who are uh, same gender, same sex, uh, as well as people who are not romantically attracted to each other, would, they would benefit from also the, the same-sex marriage being legalized everywhere. Um, and uh, there was actually recently a law paper published in Stanford Law Review, uh, Elizabeth Evans, and Elizabeth Evans is the author about, about called a compulsory sexuality, and it's about how asexuality is, uh, is reflected in and affected by laws. I think getting rid of any existing, I, think, I forget how many states still have uh, consummation laws, if you can believe that, that would really help to get rid of those. Um, but uh, as more asexual people are coming out of colleges, because we're a pretty young population, myself excluded, no, I'm not the only over 30 person who's asexual, but there's a lot of college people who are coming to realize that this is their identity and their going out into the world, into the job market. And there's probably going to be more discrimination cases as well because asexual people are often thought of as um, not fitting into the culture in certain ways. Not all of us, but uh, that, can, that can mark you as an other and it can cause, it can cause some problems like legally. So. And I'm going to look at this last one, which says, what would you say to someone who doesn't feel ace enough? This is, ooh, this is something that doesn't get talked about enough in asexual circles, actually. There are people who identify as demisexual, people who identify as gray asexual, who are somewhere on the spectrum. They're, they're not completely without sexual or sexual attraction. Thank you. But they, they experience it so rarely or in such specialized situations that they might as well be asexual and they have a mostly asexual experience in their lives. And I think that's the kind of person we're talking about here. What would I say to them? Um, I would say that most of the people who oppose asexual uh, inclusion of gray identities are just loud. They're not the majority. I think most of us are really accepting and that you, you know you do have a place in the under the asexual umbrella. I think that you 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 belong. You belong there if you feel that you belong there and you share almost all of your experiences with other people in the asexual community. Um, and uh, other than that, I don't I don't know what else I would say except that I I think I think it's a real shame that uh, anybody on any side of this argument Make somebody feel like they're not they're not nice enough, um, but I, I, it, it's pretty common I think in, in uh, certain stripes of the various queer communities that there are certain groups, especially like say maybe bisexual people get uh, you know they're with a perceived to be or actually is uh, opposite well, different gender <laughs> partner. They, they, get, uh, they get told they're just straight, and so they may feel not queer enough. That's, I think that that's really common and that it's a shame. So I think, I, I think it's, uh, it's the rest of our responsibility to try to be more, more inclusive, I think. And I'm really sorry that you've had that experience of feeling excluded. Um, I have another <laughs> question that has appeared. One person who's really sexual and one asexual, how often do they break up or not? Oh, uh, I don't have statistics, unfortunately. Um, I think it, I think in that situation, it probably matters what you mean by really sexual because sometimes if you're really very, very, like, um, very sexually attracted, very, um, aroused often and have an asexual partner who doesn't want to deal with it, uh, the question is, well, what what counts as intimacy for you? Like, would you be okay with it if they, you know, if they were intimate with you, but, they, but it wasn't penetrative sex, or it was only a massage, or it was only using a toy, or something like that? 
would that still be okay with you? Could that work out? Uh, I think when people are on opposite degrees of the spectrum, it can be a lot harder to meet in the middle, but it really just depends on what does it for you. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have statistics on how often they break up because I don't think anybody's done a study on that. Um, so anything that I, I would say that pretended to be definitive on that would probably just be me talking out of my butt, which hopefully I haven't done too much of tonight. So if anybody doesn't has anything else to say, you can. Um, and if not, I'm probably going to shut up. So is that it? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for.